Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could I ask everybody to ensure that their electronic devices are switched off or on silent mode so it doesn't interfere with the meeting. Um, agenda item one invites us to take agendas items four and five in private. The committee agreed. Thank you. Can I move us on to agenda item two, which is oral evidence from Audit Scotland um, on their briefing principles for a fu digital future. And I welcome Fraser McKinley, controller of audit, Gemma Diamond, senior manager, Morag Camps, the audit manager, and Lucy Jones, auditor, all from Audit Scotland. Um, could I invite brief opening remarks from Fraser McKinley and Gemma Diamond? Thank you, convener, and good morning, members. Very brief word uh, from me, and then I'll hand over to Gemma to talk a little bit about the content. I think the main thing I wanted to say is this is a slightly different um, report for us. Um, as you know, as this committee knows more than most, we've done a lot of work over the last few years on IT projects that have not gone well. Uh, and in discussion with the committee and others, we felt it would be helpful to try and pull together what we think some of the, the main themes and principles are from our experience of doing that work. Um, so the team have pulled together um, a, a set of principles, which Gemma will touch on in a second, which we think are um, both the things that um, aren't in place uh, when things go wrong and therefore the things that really need to be in place if these major IT and digital programmes uh, are to be delivered successfully. Um, as well as drawing on our, on our own work, you'll see that we've uh, drawn on work from uh, colleagues in other audit organisations around the world and indeed uh, other organisations as well. And what's interesting is there's lots of commonality around around the themes. So we are very happy today uh, to bring this report to the committee to help you consider how you might take forward um, uh, some scrutiny of the whole question of uh, digital public services and IT, uh, and also hopefully to inform a debate more widely in the public services uh, as to how these things can be done more effectively in the future. So with that convener, I'll just ask Gemma to add a few words on the content, if that's okay. So what we wanted to do with this document was really to kind of have it as serve as a um, to simulate discussion within public bodies about what some of the learning has been from other organisations and what weaknesses and what things they might need to, to look at to be able to learn from that. So what we wanted to do was rather than to set it out in a kind of checklist format, we set it around um, a series of principles. Now there's five main principles, but they all intertwine with each other. You can't look at them separately. You have to look at them all together. And throughout all our reports, we've always pulled out skills and experience as a really key thing um, for organisations to have in place. And so what we've done is we've intertwined that throughout the whole document because it affects all of the principles. And we've used a little icon to draw attention to that because it's really such a key factor. So really what we want to do is use, that, use this document for to help organisations to move forward, to learn from the past. And we've used a series of case studies and quotes to help to illustrate our points, to bring real life examples in of where these things have happened. As Fraser mentioned, we're very happy to take more detailed questions on any of the principles in the document. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you both very much. I wonder whether I could kick off just so that we um, set the scene, um, because the committee only obviously considers IT projects where there have been problems. Um, so I'm keen to kind of get a sense of the overall picture. So um, could you give us an idea of how much public money has cumulatively been lost as a result of the, the IT failures we're aware of? And can you give us a picture of the, the kind of ratio of successful to unsuccessful IT projects? Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you that just now, convener, but we can certainly try and, uh, certainly on the numbers, uh, we, can, we can do a bit of work there. I think on, on the balance of successful and non-successful might be a wee bit trickier to get just because there's an awful lot of IT development that goes on kind of under the radar, but we can certainly see what we can do and write back to you if that would be helpful. They would. Sure. At the same time, just to get an idea of how that compares to maybe other countries, um, you know, around the globe, and also um, how that compares, if it's possible to get these figures, with the private sector in Scotland, because I'm sure not everything is as wonderful as it might seem. So it'd be useful to get that that context. Um, I'll invite colleagues in. I think I Alex Neil. Yep. Very, very quickly emphasise that last point. I think it would be a useful exercise to benchmark ourselves against other countries. I mean, Estonia being a very good example of a country that's well advanced in its use of IT, but not necessarily for data purposes, but certainly, you know, the, the government is paper, literally paper free. Um, and there may be others as well, as well as benchmarking against the private sector. Um, 
and I think that would be a useful exercise for Orange Scotland to do, to give us a, a sense of what we need to do to get to a position where we are, you know, in the, at the top of the league for performance and all of this stuff. Just very briefly, Kavira, yes, absolutely, Mr O'Neill, happy to do that. Um, we've done a bit of that in doing this work in, in that we've looked at uh, reports which which have looked at places like Estonia and we know the government uh, is looking at Estonia and other places themselves to, to get a sense of that. Uh, and I think the experience of Estonia is an interesting one because my relatively limited understanding is that they, they, in a sense, had the benefit of going from virtually no digital infrastructure to, um, to kind of fast-tracking to an entirely... Digital, rather than point. trying to unpick yeah. legacy systems, which is where we are. But that said, absolutely, things for us for us to learn. The private sector again is a really interesting example. Some of the reports that we link to in our pro in our report have some examples of of private sector uh, that have both gone well and indeed some that really haven't. And to take the convener's point, I think uh, I think it is too simplistic to say that the private sector do this well and the public sector don't. I think basically you just don't hear about it as much in the private sector. Um, so again, we can have a think about what more information we can get on that, recognising that inevitably that is going to be more difficult for us uh, to get to get to grips with. But we'll certainly have a look. That's very helpful. Sorry, Gemma? Just to add as well, the European Commission do do some benchmarking of, of um, European countries and their digital. It tends to be at a UK level, um, but that might be something, again, that we, you know, the Scottish Government itself can explore in terms of how they benchmark themselves against um, within the UK and against the European Commission, because there is that information available from the at EC level. We, in our excellent. further reading list, we do link to one of the benchmarking reports okay. as well. Thank you very much. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Peter. I have to say, when I, when I got this report, I was a little bit surprised. It wasn't what I expected. Um, the report is an aggregation of best practice as much as anything else. I had sort of anticipated from what the Auditor General had been talking about that what we were going to get was a, a better analysis of what's happening in the public sector IT procurement within Scotland in, in, in view of the problems, the well, the well publicised problems that we've had with NHS, NHS 24 and other systems that have been installed. Uh, I had expected that we were going to get a better overview of what the steps the government's taken, the new, the new structure they put in, whether it was working, and how, how all this was going to be pulled together in the future. And you know, obviously, this doesn't quite do it. Um, is there an intention to do an, that analysis of the public sector in Scotland, which, which is really what uh, I think this committee is looking for? So, that's very helpful, Mr Beatty, and apologies if there's been a, a mismatch in expectations there. Um, so the short answer is yes, we've, and more I can maybe say a little bit more about the work that we have planned to do that. And it's also, I guess, worth reminding the committee that we are revisiting some of the individual projects that are in here, most notably the CAP Futures programme. Uh, we're publishing an update report on that in the next uh, month or so. Morag, do you want to say a wee bit about the work that's planned in a couple of years' time? Yeah, so we've just published our five-year work programme and as part of that in 2018-19 we're um, planning to do some work looking at um, digital in health and central government as well. We've not fully scoped that work but looking at things like the um, assurance framework that was just brought in and the digital first standards and the, the digital strategy, how the Scottish Government's doing against that would be um, part of that work. I think from discussions we've had in the committee previously, we, we've obviously been concerned about individual projects, but we're also concerned about the overall health of IT procurement. You can easily get bogged down in one particular project that's going wrong and dig deep into that and get into the morass there. We were looking for a rather more overarching picture as to how, uh, how we were going to avoid that situation in the future, what steps the government had taken, the structures they'd put in place, and obviously... That's what we, you know, I, I personally would be very keen to see that. So, uh, um, the the work that Gemma's uh, sorry that Morag's described, Mr. Beatty, will will do that. I think there's an issue of timing for us. A lot of the stuff that's just been implemented is quite new, uh, and we have reported to the committee and elsewhere about about those. And you've taken the evidence yourselves, in fact. So the reason it's in there for 2018-19 is that, that those frameworks and that approach will have been in place for a few years, and we'll be in a much better position, I think, to. Uh, provide some conclusions and judgments on the extent to which it's Is working. Practically speaking, it would be too soon to do something on it now. I mean, we, we, we could describe the arrangements as they are now, but I'm not sure we'd be able to reach many conclusions on how effective they are because, because of, they are relatively new. I think what I would say is that the, the point that we make in this report 
is that um, there are many things at play here to do that, that characterise uh, the success or failure of an IT project. Um, procurement is a really important one, but as we say in here, we think there are lots of other things that, that you've seen, that we've seen, that mean these things don't work. Uh, so what we're trying to do, I guess, is to pull those things out just now as, a, as hopefully quite a useful step just now for people to look at and reflect on, and then there will be a more, if you like, traditional audit product coming uh, in a couple of years' time when we can actually see how the new arrangements are working in practice. On a, on a practical level, what sort of uh, expertise does Audit Scotland have internally in respect to IT projects? Um, we have a team of ICT auditors who um, spend most of their time working uh, in individual public bodies, councils, health boards and others, uh, looking at the IT arrangements in those bodies. Uh, and then as we do this kind of work and as we look at IT projects more widely, we, we draw on external expertise sometimes to help, um, to help our own understanding of that. Um, the team here have obviously worked quite extensively now on IT projects, so we develop our own expertise as we're doing the work. But we would recognise that we're not, in that sense, IT experts. What we bring is that audit expertise and asking the questions uh, that we think need to be answered. And, and hopefully, I guess, what we try to do is, is, is try and simplify what can quite often be very technical and complex uh, situations and, and, and jargon and things. So that, that's, what, that's what we try to bring to it. And we make sure that we get the kind of technical expertise that we need to ensure that the judgments we're making are credible. G given you've produced this document, what do you expect happens with this document now? Do you expect the Scottish Government to adopt it? Or? So, yes, it's been well received by the Government and others. Um, it's being picked up uh, in all the trade press, so uh, Computer Weekly, all these kinds of things are, are running stories on it, so we would expect it to be picked up through that route. Uh, and then, uh, more specifically, locally, we, we would expect our auditors to ensure that individual public bodies are looking at this report and reflecting on it, and we'll be keeping an eye on how that's actually responded to. So, Doctors on the ground will be yep. using this as their... Yep. Absolutely. Bible. Yeah, and, and where there are uh, big set-piece IT projects. I mean, what, one of the reasons we thought we wanted to do this kind of thing now is that we have things like Social Security um, coming down the line, which is going to have a very significant IT requirement to run the new powers that the Parliament has around Social Security. So one of the reasons we wanted to publish something quite quickly around good practice is to ensure that this this kind of stuff is fed into that, uh, the planning for those big systems. So as well as looking at it in individual bodies, there are some, we know there are some pretty big IT requirements coming down the line, and hopefully this will help uh, avoid some of the pitfalls we've experienced in the past. Now, we understand that the Scottish Government uh, uh, officials have been commissioned to develop an assurance process for major IT projects. Uh, or ID, ID programmes, over five million. Um, how does this document fit in to the assurance process that the Scottish Government is developing? Yeah, I mean, that's very specifically, Mr Beattie, that's one of the things we we'll want to be looking at in some detail when we come back to the, the next piece of work, um, because the new assurance framework is a really important part of this. I guess in terms of this report and our principles, um, it, it touches on a number of things, not least the kind of planning, governance, leadership and strategic oversight um, elements of this. We think the, the assurance framework is, it, it should be helping with some of the principles that we think need to be in place, uh, but clearly we'll be keeping a very close eye on the extent to which that assurance framework is actually working. And still on that sort of theme, the, I understand that uh, there's an Audit Scotland checklist that the Scottish Government uses or is putting in place. Yeah. Yeah. Again, how does this fit into that? Is the, che is the checklist an existing one? Is it being amended and updated to take into account this report? So um, you might remember a couple of years ago we produced a report on managing ICT contracts that kind of followed up an earlier report, um, which again was looking at the, the Scottish Government bringing in the new assurance framework and what, um, what their role was. And what we did at that time was that the, uh, we appended with that report a checklist of kind of things for... Um, um, senior management and boards to consider as they were implementing um, an ITT project and this report very much kind of works works with that it's kind of supplementary to that and um, provides a bit more detail on where some of the pitfalls have been in the past from projects where some of the areas are that the boards and um, senior managers really need to look at to kind of give themselves an honest assessment of, of where their weaknesses are so they're really kind of this all works together with that okay okay um, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, good morning to you. Um, I found the report quite useful, actually, in capturing 
many of the issues, but I kind of feel it's like almost a second edition publication of something I've read years ago. <laughs> you know, other than the currency of some of the projects that you've mentioned, it's it's the same kind of messages again and again, year after year. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering where, where on earth are we with things like software project management methodologies, quality assurance processes. And I've asked this kind of thing before. So why we might sit here and say, oh, the Scottish Government has accepted this and the public sector's looking at it and so is everybody else. It's the, the step change, but it's the what happens next that actually delivers what we think should be delivered that, that, that really interests me. So I'd, I'd be interested to know, just across the landscape from your own experience, who actually embraces formal methodologies, either in the Scottish Government or in the public sector? Who does that? And if, if they are embracing these standards, why do we still get these software projects wrong? So I'll, I'll kick off on that convener and ask the team come in. So I suppose this is the thing that is the kind of head scratching thing for us, Mr. Coffey. It's kind of, well, in some, in some places, some of these things are in place and yet it still doesn't work, which is one of the reasons that we thought we tried to do something like this, to try and pull together what we think are the kind of the key ingredients, if you like, of, of success. But you're absolutely right that uh, when you look at, even take some of the ones that you've looked at recently, whether it's NHS 24 or I6 and the police, they were using methodologies. So it wasn't a complete absence of they hadn't thought about it. And yet, in fact, in the case of the things like I6, we, we reckon that the procurement process, just looking at that bit specifically, was actually pretty good, pretty sound. Uh, and yet it still didn't, it still didn't work. Um, I think where I get to with that, so so I don't think I don't think there's a there's a concern or an issue about people not being aware of or not using industry recognised approaches to these things. We see that everywhere. I think there is an issue about industry approaches moving on. So you'll remember one of the things in the I six example was using what they called the waterfall approach, that very kind of top down uh, approach, which which these days is used much less often and they use, as we describe it in here, the more agile approach, so kind of smaller, uh, you know, smaller phases of, of programme being the way forward. I think the thing we've tried to emphasise in here is that you can't just get one of these things right or two of these things right or three of these things right. They all have to be in place. And I think when you look at the, the six examples that we've drawn on at the start of this report, they have some of those principles in place, but they were also lacking in one or two of them. So I think the main lesson for me I would draw is the absolute need to have all of these things in place and to ensure for me that the leadership is right um, and importantly for me that there's a, a realism attached to leadership that is both engaged and committed but also a little bit independent, a little bit separate. I think what we've seen in a lot of these examples is that people get so drawn into wanting the thing to work that they lose a bit of perspective uh, and I think what, what we... Uh, have tried to draw out here is that importance of being clear about different roles and responsibilities so there is a mechanism to, to take that step back. And one of the things that the assurance framework is designed to do is improve the gateway process. You've heard evidence on a number of occasions that some of these projects that haven't worked have gone through a gateway process and have been told that it looks okay. Um, and the assurance framework now is designed to have a much more robust kind of stop-go mechanism. And actually sometimes I think uh, actually recognising when we're better cutting our losses is something that we need to be better at as well. So that's kind of a long, a long answer to a short question, uh, Mr Coffey, but I think for me it's that sense of having all of these things in place rather than just a few of them. I mean, I think that's, that's perfectly true. Uh, I mean, see, when you, when you mentioned I6 there, and even if you look at the CARP system, um, is it fair to say that the errors or the mistakes are occurring at the front end of these projects and in my experience convener that if you don't get it right at the beginning you're hardly likely to get it right at the end either uh, and, and what that boils down to is, is understanding what the users or the customers actually require and investing time energy and resource into getting that right usually if you do get that right you get the project right so if, if, if organizations are embracing these standards and methodologies it's still a bit of a mystery as to why they're getting it wrong. Perhaps it is a skills and experience and expertise issue. Because, it, I mean, it's easy enough to say that we, we use and embrace a quality standard, but if we don't really know how to use it, then you're, it's not going to be much good to you. So is, is there something that we need to, to, to learn and understand about, about this whole basket of five principles? 
And if we were to ask you or anyone to, to apply those and tell us across the landscape, Scottish Government, public sector landscape, whether they are truly embraced, would, would, what kind of picture do you think we might get from something Jim, like that? Do you want to pick that up? I, th I think it's a very variable picture, and I think what, what we see is that what works in one organisation won't necessarily work in another organisation. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution to that, and that's really because of around some of these softer issues like like the leadership and like the culture, the different cultures of organisations, you'll see it when you have witness in front of you that the culture of different organisations is very different. So what works in one won't necessarily work in another. So it's, it's very difficult then to know actually which principle applies more in different ones. There will be, a di whilst they all apply, they'll all apply in different mixes in, in, in different places. Um, I think you're right that the skills and experience is, is very important and we, we remarked on that in all our audit reports and, and very much throughout this that actually at the very front end as you described that's where if you if you set off on the wrong track it's very hard to, to change tracks then to, to pull it back but what you really need at, at the start is the skills and experience of somebody who's done this kind of for their experience to say well actually what is it that we need what is an honest assessment of, our, of the skills of our organisation because it's very easy if you've not done something before to not know what you don't have you know if you've not done something you can assume that you have the skills and experience but actually until you get halfway down the line you realise oh actually we don't have what we need so that's where the sharing of the learning the talking to other organisations the critical friends and the mentoring across the public sector is really key so that um, a chief executive of, of an organisation gets some um, realistic expectation of actually what it's like to do one of these projects, what the skills and experience he needs and how they, how they can fill the gaps um, that they think they have. Do, do you think there's a, is there an extra dimension, an extra issue in the public sector in terms of time critical nature of some of these projects? I mean, we've mentioned CARP and I, CARP was it? incredibly time cr critical and, and I don't know about I6 really, but I suppose it was too, but the, the new software for the social security system in Scotland is going to be pretty time critical as well and that already gives me some concerns that there'll be huge pressure in there to get something working and, uh, and often that is the first mistake we, we all make, we, we make and not accepting that some of these systems are very complex and they need the time to be developed and to be done. If you hurry a solution, you don't get one you get something that you don't really want and there's not any good to anyone. So, can you, and I feel that we collectively have to keep saying these messages, but we have to try to persuade those who make the decisions about procurement and development of software to really invest and give the developers the time to put these packages together, because the, the talent is there to write this software, there's no doubt about it, but you can't do it in a hurry, and you can't do it unless you completely understand what the customers or users' requirements actually are. And I feel as though I'm singing an old song again, convener, and this has been said before, but we need to make that step change to try to improve this whole software development process. And I think it can be done, but I think that can investment at the front end and giving developers the time to do this properly is, is absolutely essential. And I look forward to, I think, the next piece of work that, that Audit Scotland will do on this. Okay. Monica Lennon. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, just following on from Willie Coffey's points, um, I think it's important to put this into perspective. It's not just talking about a couple of computers in a, a, a back room somewhere. You know, we're talking about £4 billion that's been spent on ICT in the last five years and a huge sum as well on, on procurement alone. And when it does go wrong, it can have a huge impact on, on the public and on businesses. So um, it is quite important. But I guess... Like Willie Coffey, I'm, you know, I'm looking for some reassurance that that people are going to start to get this, and I don't think there's a shortage of guidance, and it sounds like there's clear methodologies um, and industry standards. So, is this really about taking ownership within an organisation? Because it feels like when people say, "Oh, we're having IT problems," it's like something that's happening over there somewhere else. It's not really a management problem; it's a computer problem. But everything that I've read so far. It is about management, it is about having the right skill set. So again, maybe repeating Willie Coffey's points, but you know, are we going to see this big leap forward? Because it's not just a problem in Scotland, I appreciate, but in terms of where we are in Scotland, is there going to be a sort of light bulb moment? So, um, it's, well, we, let's hope so. Um, and I mean, to be fair, I don't, I'm not sure it's a case of people not 
not kind of really trying to get it. Um, I, and so, what, I mean, to be honest, one of the things we grappled with with this with this piece of work is is trying to avoid just motherhood and apple pie and, and frankly, stating the, stating the bleeding obvious. So um, you'll come to your own judgment about how we've done with that, I suppose. But, um, but there is something for us about um, trying to pull out those things. And to come to your point uh, around leadership, I think what's very clear is that people are struggling, I think, a little bit to go from a world in which it was about IT to digital public services. They are not the same thing. And they require quite a different mindset. They require a different set of leadership skills and behaviours. Digital is about how you run your business. It's not about an IT project. IT is an important part of it, but it's much wider than that. So I think I think there's a big transition. You'll have heard all the stuff about it being the next industrial revolution and all that kind of stuff. And there is definitely something in that. Um, I think just to very briefly use an example of where in NHS 24, we, we updated the committee um, uh, towards the end of last year. And I think that's an interesting wee case study in, in the NHS 24 experience. And my sense of it is that for quite a long time, they, and to some extent, we were very focused on, on the IT project. It was about trying to get the IT project to work. And then a new chief executive came in, had a look and said, actually, do you know what? There are other issues at play here about the role of the organisation, how it's staffed, how people are trained, what, what its job is. And I think took quite a brave decision to say, we're not going to commit to another date to implement the IT project because we need to really go back to first principles. And, and in a sense, I think do what you're describing, which is to really figure out not how do we get the IT project in, but what is it we're trying to achieve with this thing. And in that context, a hugely important um, thing that they do uh, in terms of out of our care and, and everything else. So, so I think at times, and it comes back to Mr. Coffey's point, I think, about the environment and the, the I-6, police I-6 was a classic case, as we reported, about the political with a small p environment being such that people were absolutely desperate to make that thing work. And it's quite a di in, that, in that environment, it is quite a difficult thing to say, do you know what, we're going to press the pause button because we're not sure this is right. Um, so I, I do think there is something in there for leadership and management that recognises it's not about IT, it's about how we run our business. I'm quite interested by the point you made about, um, you know, being brave and basically saying, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing now. But in your report, you talk about this uh, political context with a small P, which contributed to, I suppose, the misplaced optimism um, throughout the, the I6 programme, which we know has been a disaster. Um, in your report on page nine, I think it is, um, you mentioned that legislative and ministerial commitments can reduce flexibility in timeframes. I just wondered, could you maybe flesh that out a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think as Mr Coffey said, there's no doubt that there are some projects where there are really, that when there are proper hard deadlines uh, that are not entirely within the control of the government or whichever organisation is doing it, and CAP would be, would be one of those. Uh, and this is why I think it's really important that we learn these lessons in advance of the social security powers coming in, for sure. Um, I think the lesson there is that, it, so, so there is a hard deadline. What is, what is the minimum we should be asking? What is the minimum we can we need to deliver to make this thing work by that deadline. I think what we do too often, this is where the optimism thing comes in, is that we say, well, that's the minimum, and it would be really good if we could do this other stuff as well. And maybe if we added in this bit of functionality, and while we're at it, we'll just, and then before you know it, it's an even bigger and more complex thing uh, than it was, than it, than it was even, than it needed to be in a sense. So I think that's where the realism comes in. Um, is recognising what the deadline is, recognising what needs to be in place for that deadline, and then taking a, a, a more phased approach, potentially, to adding things in beyond that. And too often we, we tend to throw the kitchen sink at these things, I think. Again, when looking at these reports, I always try and, and think about you know, the, the benefits to the public. And we talk about um, transforming public services, health and social care would be one of the examples that, that we've talked about on this committee before. Um, but I think all too often IT systems are still pretty much detached from each other. So I know there's some progress being made, but how optimistic are you that we're going to see systems properly integrated so that public services can be joined up and people can get the best possible experience? Gemma? 
Yeah, to be honest, I think that's, I mean, we've pulled out users as, as one of our five key principles, really, to kind of to make that point about how important it is to involve the users in the project. Um, essentially, they are one of the key success factors. You know, if, if people don't like the system or if it doesn't do what they want it to do, they won't use it and, and, and then it can't be judged as a success. I think what we are seeing is, as Fraser mentioned, in that kind of shift to digital public services is a recognition of the role of the user and how important it is to get to get them involved. So we are sh seeing that shift in culture, I think. Um, one of the things we'll be doing when we do our, the, the next piece of work is to look at that and to look at how um, users are being involved in, th in things and what difference that is making. But I think we are starting to see some of the signs of that, of that shift in culture about how important the users are and how they need to be involved. Have you got any good examples of that where the user is not just on the margins and a little bit of consultation, they're actually there at the design stage and, and all the way through? Mark, have you got... Yeah, I think we, we sort of pull out registers of Scotland, obviously had issues in the past, but they're very much focused on the users and that's like internal users um, like th that are actually going to be using the system and white sort of wider business as well, but also like solicitors um, that are going to be using the systems as well. And they've been, you know, bringing these people in um, actually into sort of test ideas out with them and then actually test test the software out with them as well. So, you know, there are examples out there of, of organisations that are doing that. I think um, Revenue Scotland would be another example that learned good lessons um, uh, as they were setting up the systems there. I mean, I think you mentioned health and social care. I mean, there's absolutely no underestimating the challenge there because trying to get council and NHS systems to talk to each other uh, is going to be a mammoth task. And um, and we are, as you know, reporting, we'll be reporting a lot over the next few years on, on integration. And, um, and similarly, again, to the police, what we find is that the public service reform bit transforming services bit is running ahead of the systems bit, which actually does get in the way of people trying to do the job on the ground, whether you're a police officer or whether you're a care worker or whether you're um, uh, somebody working in, in, in a hospital. So um, again, I think there's a recognition that that's a really important thing. I think in the case of integration, it, it feels like they're quite still quite a long way away from grappling with that. A lot of the attention has been on getting the integration joint boards up and running. Um, so again, that's something that we'll be looking at in terms of how the plans and how what they're actually doing on the ground to help join up data, to help join up systems, all with a view to ensuring that the, the service that, um, that service users are getting is the best it can possibly be. Thank you. Ross Thompson. <clears throat> Thank you very much, convener. Um, when reading the, sort of the, the, the key principles, particularly around about planning, it was amazing how in some ways it sounded like it was stating the obvious around about um, having the right skills um, all the way, you know, throughout the project, and how often those were lacking. And we've seen that from, you know, when we've looked at I six, for example, uh, and, and other projects. Um, the reason for that being, do you think it is a cultural thing almost? Because I know from being in Aberdeen City Council, working with officials, there can sometimes be a resistance to getting external advice in because it's external. Um, there's always this assumption that it can be done in house. It's better off doing it in house. So, how do you think that is a problem um, in terms of uh, the public sector, um, and how do we kind of break through that? It, it's a, I mean, it's a key issue, and and there may be a bit of that. Um, I think, I think, I think there are other things at play, like the genuinely the market for good uh, IT skills is very, very tight and expensive. You know, and and there is an issue I think about. Um, what the public sector is able to pay for the best people in, in, in IT. Um, and uh, that's both in terms of bringing people into the organisation, but also, to be honest, paying daily rates, uh, some of which can be quite substantial. And people are, understandably, in the current environment, um, not not that desperate to do that. You know, they, they think very carefully before doing it. Again, I think the, the key thing um, for us is it comes to this thing about being an intelligent client. You need to make sure, particularly I have to say, when you're working with some of the big technology providers, the big technology integrators who do this stuff day in, day out. And at those initial planning and, and particularly through the procurement and negotiation stages, it's so important that the client side, the public sector side, has people on their side that can engage in that negotiation and discussion as equals. Um, and, and that's not an easy thing to crack and it almost certainly does mean that you're bringing people in from outside. It's something the government are aware of. They're, they're, they're investing um, quite a lot in, in this whole agenda around skills. They're, they're training up um, digital champions who are you know, senior people who are not you know, techies, to use that horrible word, but are 
um, going to be leading organisations into digital age. So, so they are recognising that, but, but they are playing catch up a little bit, I think. Actually, you've answered part of my second question just there about what, what the Scottish Government is doing. So I appreciate they're, they're you know, taking the time out to, to ensure people are trained up, skilled up. When we looked at CAP, we actually saw there was issues about staff morale as well there. Um, it wasn't a good situation at all. Um, and you know, there's the, the risk of losing people. So do you know if they're looking at addressing those issues so you don't just see people with the right skills actually going out the door that we're actually working to retain them? In our um, last um, overarching report, the Managing ICT Contracts we report, we mentioned about the digital transformation service that the Scottish Government was setting up, which was the, uh, an effort really to try and plug those skills gaps, to have some centralised um, skills and, and people that could then be used to go around different organisations within central government to try and help fill those skills gaps. And that's, again, a, a way of trying to stop those skills going out the door, so somebody getting great experience working on a project and then leaving to go off into the private sector, for example. So that was that effort to try and keep them in. Again, that's something that we're very interested in and um, are going to be um, reporting back on how that is working in our next audit report as well, because we're interested to see kind of um, how much that's taken off and how much is being used. Um, one of the other key principles is around about leadership. Um, and again, it was interesting to lead that, read that often we have failure in ICT projects because of weak leadership. Um, and again, that kind of uh, sounds familiar from, again, from experience in council, when often um, you can see other projects, whether that's infrastructure projects, capital projects, often sometimes there's issues because the project management isn't there, the leadership um, isn't there. Um, so I see that those issues have been flagged up in the report, but do you have an, a recommended model? I mean, how should that work? What are you saying to, to government that they should be putting in place to ensure that there's strong leadership on all of these projects, to ensure it's delivered on time, on budget and appropriately? Yeah. So, so we've, um, we've not gone as far as recommending any specific models or methodologies because we think it's important that the individual organisations pick an approach that's suitable for them and for the project. So, so that's why we've taken a kind of principles-based approach. Um, and, and as I've said, some of the stuff the government is doing is designed to help the most senior people in the public sector think about their leadership in, in a digital age. So it's not about how do I lead IT projects necessarily. It's about what does this mean for the way we, we run our business. Uh, and there is also work, as, as Gem has described, um, uh, in terms of the actual delivery of ICT projects. I mean, it's interesting. It, it, it does strike me, and, and maybe there's more we could do on this, is, is whether there are lessons to be learned from other big infrastructure projects. Um, we've, you know, we, we seem to be managing to build a big bridge across the fourth, the fourth river. And so I wonder if there's some, it's very different, but I wonder if there are some parallels um, that, we, that, that, um, that people could draw on around that leadership and programme management approach and apply to these kinds of things. So there's maybe something in there for us to think about as well. Do you think there's an issue where sometimes we just don't have the governance structure right and the reporting structure right, but is there also an issue with sometimes you just don't have the people with the right skills to actually project manage as well? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a strong body of evidence in all the, in all the reports we refer to in here that, for example, if, if in, uh, in some of the examples we've seen down south, if you've got four senior responsible owners in a year, all of whom are bringing a different approach, then that's clearly not going to work. Um, and uh, and that it, to come back to your culture point, there is an interesting thing, I think, about the public service and maybe the civil service in particular, where we expect people to be generalists. So one minute you're, you're running, you know, an area on culture next minute you're running a big IT project and um, now they bring enormous skills and experience to that um, but I think what we've said in the past in the committee I think was very clear in relation to NHS 24 is there is a question about whether that expectation of our senior people in in public service is reasonable given the scale and complexity of some of these IT projects that we're looking at. Thank you, convener. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Um, I find that line of questioning from Ross Thompson very interesting, actually. The, uh, you talk about the lessons learned on other infrastructure projects. Uh, in some ways, when I'm looking through this, I'm saying this, these are just failures of project management. I mean, Ross and I come from the northeast, and you've got an enormous oil-related projects um, you know, on, on much bigger scales than any of this going swimmingly. You know, and it, it, as I think Ross was getting to, you get the right people in, you get the right project going. Uh, and I think the leadership's uh, an important part of that. Where I get to, though, is you've got a whole section on governance. Your section on governance doesn't go quite as far as to talk about accountability. Uh, and I just wondered 
shouldn't that be addressed in the report in the sense that as, as you know from our various sessions I have a big issue that very few people seem to be held accountable for these failures the finger rarely gets pointed at one individual oughtn't that to be part of the report saying somebody's head should roll if this goes wrong I think that's a very fair question um, now, now you've mentioned that Mr Kerr I think so, so we talk in various places about rules and responsibilities and governance and those kinds of things, and there should always be someone that is that is clearly accountable for the delivery of of the project. Um, and I completely understand your frustration sometimes when you've got people sitting in front of you and you're saying, so who's responsible for this and who's accountable for it, and, and you're not getting a clear answer. I think I would also say that though sometimes it is, you know, these things are not clear cut. They are. Um, big and complex and there are lots of different things at play uh, so sometimes actually pinning it on a person is quite difficult but your, your point is well made I'll take that away and have a think about how we might talk about it Gemma um, we've actually we talk a little bit about accountability in the leadership section recognizing kind of whereabouts it, it sits within the organization and um, I've got quite an interesting quote in there from um, a report from South Australia which it talks about the difference between responsibility and, and accountability and I think that's an important thing for organisations to think about actually when they're putting the governance structures in place about where responsibility for delivering a, a project lies and where that actual accountability is because that can lie at different places um, within an organ organisation. Yeah, I thought that uh, the, the South Australia quote was very useful actually. I just it, it might be worth just pulling that into the body to say, you know, this isn't just an example, this is a, a, a principle. Um, and, and moving on from that, the, the, the following page from where you've got your South Australia ex example, uh, you talk about the senior officers and the stable leadership and reference quite rightly, obviously, that the, there's a kind of revolving door often, uh, and that will be a cause of failure. You don't then go on to say how we prevent that. I, I, I mean, when I was reading through, one of the things I thought was, why aren't we talking about uh, some kind of performance-related pay? Rather than people coming in and being paid vast amounts of money and said, deliver this, why aren't we talking about some kind of performance related pay or golden handcuffs or something like that to stop the revolving door and deliver the success? So, again, a very good question. I mean, I think we um, th there's a kind of balance to be struck, isn't there? Because my guess is that sometimes the revolving door happens because it's not going very well. So, so there's a link between your accountability point and sometimes the revolving door point. And there is a thing about, well, how long do you give someone uh, to try and get a thing to work? Uh, I think your point is well made, though, about how do we ensure that um, if we are able to, first of all, recruit and, re and attract the best, um, and I think there are big questions in there about reward and other things, what mechanisms are there in place um, to make sure that those people are are staying. Um, now, a lot of folk will come to these things because professionally they'll be enormously rewarding and, and uh, you know, they're good things to work on. But there is also clearly in this market a question of remuneration and pay. The model for that, not really for us to, to comment on, I guess. But I think what's helpful about your your questions is there is something that we can think about as to, as to how organisations and the government and councils and whoever it is are thinking about exactly that topic as they're, as they're beginning to progress this stuff. Yep. Uh, slightly different line, if I may. The, how is your report? There are obviously some projects running. Uh, so the, the renewed CAP project, uh, the NHS project. Uh, do you get any sense that they're obviously in, in the process? So how is this going to be taken on by those projects? They're, they're clearly not going to stop uh, and reboot, as it were. Uh, how are these principles going to be taken on by the projects already running? I think, I mean, it's a really interesting question, and I think ones like CAP, which are actually nearly finished, and we'll bring you an update in a, in a month's time on that, that, that actually there's, the conversation has so far moved on um, from this. But I think it's really important for um, organisations who are in the midst of an IT project to have a look at this and to think, and to have we talked earlier about that honest assessment of actually where are we against some of these things where what is our um governance structure is, it, is our governance structure working for us is it giving us the speed of decision making have we really captured all the risks um and are acting on them i think it gives 
it gives, um, I think, potentially board at board level and at senior management level the opportunity to have that kind of stock take and to say, actually, if we use this approach, if we look at these principles and we were to assess ourselves against this or to ask some challenging questions of those, lead, those people leading the projects and of the project teams to say, actually, you know, where are we against some of these things and to have that kind of open discussion about it, then that's how we hope it would, would be used um, so that they, we can have that chance to have a little pause and to have a think and have that assessment of themselves. I think, just sorry, very briefly, can we just on that, I think we'd be, um, maybe concern is too strong a word, but but I think the good, the good organisations will not just hand this to their IT director. And, and I think there is a risk that people look at this and go, it's an IT thing and hand it to their IT director. Though, this is a conversation that should be happening at corporate management teams and at board level, and that's where we would expect this to be looked at. So, is it your view that if principles are followed in this document to the letter the project will be successful and if so if an organization were to choose to deviate from those principles and therefore and then the project goes wrong should their head roll for that um so uh, I, I, so we can't give any guarantees on any of those things i guess is the is the the, the slightly glib answer to that, Mr. Kerr. I think so. Th there's no guarantee of success in any of this. I think what we're saying is, so if there's no guarantees of success, we're pretty sure that if you don't have these things in place, it ain't going to work. So if you look at it that way, um, uh, and, and as I said earlier on to one of the questions, for me, it's about ensuring that the principles for success that we've set out here are present in every stage of the project. This is not a sequence. Of principles. These are a set of principles that need to exist at every stage of a of a major IT and digital project. And and so um, certainly, if some people were to make a an explicit choice not to do some of these things, I think we'd be asking some very hard questions about that. My sense is that sometimes people th think they've got all of that in place, um, but actually don't. Um, so they think they're doing the things around leadership. They think they've got a governance in place. They think they're engaging with users. Um, so when we turn up in the middle of an IT project, it would be very unlikely for people to say, yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not engaging with users. They'll always say, yeah, we're engaging with users, but quite often it's not the right users or they're not engaging in the right way. NHS 24 is a good example of that. A lot of the activity was around the users of the system in NHS 24, which is enormously important, but there was very little engagement early on with out of our services and health boards, which is kind of the whole point of the exercise. So that definition of user is enormously important. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think now that we've done this, even if it is a little bit motherhood and apple pie, if people aren't looking at it and they can't demonstrate how they've considered it and put it in place when they're delivering a big project, then absolutely we uh, and you would be uh, right to be asking some very tough questions about that. Thank you. OK. Um, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much again, convener. Uh, uh, I think um, Fraser... McKinley mentioned something that's quite crucial here. You, you said earlier, Fraser, that public sector reforms often run ahead of systems development's ability to, to deliver. And I think that's the, a key message in here. And Liam Kerr asked, if these principles are in place, will it be guaranteed to succeed? I think the answer is definitely no. It's not guaranteed. Um, governments, public sector, they at the very outset of any software development project, I think they really need to engage with their IT staff as early as possible before commitments and announcements are made about delivery of systems like this. Because it's, it's the, the, the worst fear in the world as a software developer to be given a task and, and to be told you've got six months or a year to write something that could really, really take much longer than that. So if there's early engagement with the technology staff, and they have to be able to stand up to governments, ministers or whoever and say that cannot be done in time, so don't make that announcement. I think that's what happens right across these projects, not just in Scotland, but right across the world. You need to have technologists who will stand up at the beginning and say that it can't be done. But you also need governments and to, to be able to recognise that and to just call canny a wee bit before making pronouncements and, and announcements about when systems will be delivered. If they don't do that, convener, these kinds of projects will continue to fail to deliver on time. We could, of course, always encourage backbenchers to do likewise. <laughs> Mr McKinley. <laughs> um, 
yeah, probably not comment on that, convener. Um, but I mean, I think there, I'm struggling to remember which one it is now. But there's one of the examples in here that talks about the importance of the policy people and the IT people working really closely together. Now, that's absolutely true in an IT project, and I would say it's equally true, Mr. Coffey, before the things announced. So, um, I don't underestimate the difficulty of that sometimes for all sorts of uh, entirely legitimate reasons. But, but yes, the more. And again, I come back to NHS 24. One of the things that they did there was they actually not only did they say we're not implementing it on that date, they didn't announce another date. They said we're going to take our time, and at the at the appropriate point when we have when we're more sure, we'll let you know. Now at the time, there was a bit of backlash about that and about oh dear, what you don't know and it's rudderless and 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 how do you not know when it's going to go live? But again, there's a judgment about whether you take a bit of flack for that at that point rather than committing to a date that you then have to miss and then a subsequent date and so it goes on. Um, because our experience in, in places like NHS 24 is once you're in that spiral of naming a date and then missing it and missing it, all the issues of morale and everything else come in and it's very hard to get yourself out of that. Yep. On the basis that there are no other questions from members and I don't see any indication that there are, um, can I thank you all for coming along this morning and giving evidence to the committee. Um, I will pause the committee briefly to allow the witnesses to um, move back from the table and then we'll move on to agenda item three. Agenda item three, which is considering the draft annual report for the parliamentary year 12th May 2016 to 11th of May 2017. Do members have any comments on the report? No, subject to the one amendment that, that's been raised with me earlier, are members content to sign off the report? Okay, that's great. Can I now move the committee into private session? Thank you very much.